morning, guys. How are you guys doing? Where is Shai? Where is he? Raise your hand. Is he here? No? That was the awesomest t-shirt I ever got, let me tell you. Um, but first, let me just say thanks for the, the people who've organized the conference. Like, I can't believe what an honor it is to be here. And also, I wanted to say thank you for, you know, uh, there's some amazing set of people I get to work with every day, especially my boss and uh, all the other folks on the Angular team. And so, give it up for them. So I wanted to talk to you today about Angular 2, right? I'm sure you guys all want to know, don't you? Yeah. yeah. All right, all right, all right. And so, uh, first of all, the project is, as Igor pointed out, it's out in the open. You're welcome to check it out. You're welcome to see what's going on. We got some forks happening, stars are happening, commits are coming in. Uh, but the important point is it's really in the open. And so you get to be, have a chance to influence it, commit it, uh, uh, look at the issues. You can help us out with them, send a pull request, and so on. So I'm really excited about it. Actually, I've been so excited about Angular 2. Everybody who will listen, I tell them how excited I am. So I'm going to tell all of you now how excited I am about Angular 2. So one of the things that always comes up is um, I think there is people who are like really are, are, are slightly afraid of the new syntax. Why are we changing it? And I want to convey to you today that there are some really important reasons why we're doing these changes. And these reasons are, uh, are really uh, going to enable us to um, build the next awesome framework. And so what I want to talk to you today about is the syntax, and specifically not the syntax, because that's very much in the land of the opinion, uh, but really the semantics and the reasons behind it, which are concrete reasons uh, that we have. Now, as I said, syntax is something that is in line of the opinion. You know, syntax is just a bunch of characters you put on a page. Uh, you might like some characters. I might like some other characters. That's really not the important part. The important part is really the semantics behind it. And so when I'm going to present this to you, you know, there's going to be a part of you that's the familiar side of it. And you're going to be like, oh, I know the Angular 1 syntax, and it's so simple. It's familiar to me because, because you know, I've worked for, with it so long. And you're going to, um, the human brain has this natural tendency to confuse things that are familiar to us as things that are actually simple. But if you try and explain the syntax to somebody who has never done Angular, you will actually discover that there's actually quite a many set of rules that are, exist in Angular 1 syntax. And so we believe that Angular 2 syntax is fundamentally simpler in the sense that it has fewer rules to remember, to memorize, to understand. And as a result, it's going to be a lot more predictable, which is going to have a huge impact on performance for us. And also, it's going to be uh, more toolable. And tooling is always a nice thing to have. So the first thing we want to talk about is the most uh, familiar side of, data of, of the syntax, which is the data binding, which is how do I get the data from my model and project it to the UI? This is what most people think about when they think about data binding. So let me show you something in Angular 1. In Angular 1, when you declare a component, it turns out you could write three different kinds of components. You could say title is a literal, it's a, it could be an expression, or it could be an interpolation if the component has managed to set up proper listeners. And I think this is a an interesting thing, this is not exactly obvious when you first look at this, but the choice, which one of these three things should happen, that choice lies with the author of the component, not with the author of the template where these things get instantiated. And it turns out that that's backwards. It's really the, the author of the template where this is going to be used who should have the choice which one to write, not the author of the, the component itself. And this, this is something that uh, took me quite a long time to actually realize, but once you realize this, you go like, oh yeah, this is backwards. This has always not been the, the other way around. And so, not only that, there's three different ways. There's these special characters in the Angular 1x and the binding syntax that you have to define, you know, which one of these are you choosing. Um, so we're gonna simplify all this, and we're gonna really say there's only two different kinds of bindings. There's either a literal, or there is an expression, and we're going to put that in the bracket, and I, I'm going to explain the bracket in a second, so let's not worry about it. The key takeaway here is there's only two kinds of, of bindings we're going to uh, um, have, and as far as the component author is concerned, uh, they actually don't care which one it is. Uh, all they're interested in is that a title will be delivered to them, and whether the title is, is inlined as a literal, or whether the title is an expression, uh, that is a concern of the, uh, the template author, not the author of the component. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, is this even a valid HTML? And 
why are you putting this weird stuff on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side? And what about my interpolation? So let's, let's talk about all of these things. First of all, whoa, it is a valid HTML. Um, turns out any character over there is valid, provided few exceptional characters like equal sign or, or bracket sign. Uh, now, I know you might be thinking, well, it's still kind of not alphanumeric. So for, for those of you guys who really insist on alphanumeric characters, there is going to be an alternative syntax that will be purely alphanumeric, so, no, so it will pass the HTML validators. OK, now why are we escaping the left-hand side, not the right-hand side? So look at something like an image. This is, something that we this is a problem we have in Angular 1. Uh, when you look at the source attribute, it refers to a URL, right? The so user.png is not some object that has a user property and then has a property PNG. It's actually a URL file name called user.png. Now, when the image first gets instantiated, the browsers are eager, and so they wake up and go fetch that image. So if you put a double curly inside of there, we all know what's going to happen, right? It's gonna, the browser is actually going to fetch a URL that contains double curly username, double curly.png, and a server will return a 404, and you're going to get a dreaded error. Now, we had this problem in Angular 1, and the way we solved it is we gave you an ng source directive. Now, we could do that with the built-in attributes because we know there's a limited number of them. And as a result, we can figure out which ones need, needed to be escaping, and we gave you an alternate way of escaping them. But look what's happening in there. What we're doing, actually, the only way to solve this particular problem is to do something with the key of the attribute. Right? No amount of escaping on the right-hand side is going to solve this problem. The way we solve this problem is that we prefix the source with ng source. And so the interesting um, kind of an insight into this is that when a component wakes up, whether it's a real component inside of the browser or it's a web component, when it wakes up, it will go and read its attributes in HTML because HTML is really just a serialization of its internal state. And will read these attributes, and it does not know what the uh, double curlies mean. And the only way we can prevent it from reading those attributes is to rename the attributes. And so now the escape mechanism really becomes, like, how do we rename them? Now, this is not the only instance of it. There is another instance of it, which is, for example, disabled. Disabled is, again, special because it is Boolean. And it's not what you put in the disabled that matters. It is whether the disabled attribute is present or not inside of the DOM. And again, to solve this is that we have a special directive called ng-disabled. Now, what ng-disabled does is it actually writes to the property of the element rather than to the attribute. And now we have a problem. As, as I said, when you have internal set of uh, uh, HTML elements, you know which ones you have. You can enumerate them and you can escape them. But in the world of web components, you don't know what the web components will choose to do. And therefore, you don't know ahead of time which properties uh, will have, which attributes will have these Boolean uh, properties and which do not. And so it turns out that the proper way to handle this is to always write to properties, not to attributes. So the, the syntax is basically this. You have some component, let's say it's a pane, and it might have a title and selected, and there might be a double curly inside of it. The trouble becomes, how do I escape the title and the selected attribute? And as I said, this really falls in the land of opinion. Uh, the semantics, the reasoning that I just explained why we had to do this, uh, that's kind of fixed. But the, the characters you happen to choose, that's very much in the land of opinion. And there's a famous issue for that, issue 133 on a GitHub, where there's some 600 comments people have about what particular set of characters they choose to have. Now, what I find interesting about that issue is that everybody has an opinion about characters. Very few people actually had an opinion about the semantics of it. And what we're really discussing here is the semantics, the reasons. Why are we doing this? This is the important part. The, the, the actual characters, those can be changed by a simple regex and a search and replace, right? The semantics are a lot more complicated to change in your code. It requires a human to kind of understand and figure out what's going on. So web components uh, are an important part of Angular 2. We really would like to uh, be able to just have them and use them out of the box. And that's something that I'm going to talk about later is not really possible in Angular 1x. And the thing about web components is that they really should act like the browser's existing elements. You know, when you get a web component, you shouldn't be able to really tell or behave differently or treat the fundamental element in any different way uh, than the native one. It should just be natural to the syntax. And what this syntax actually allows is that we can get, treat the two of them in a similar way. Now, the other thing to remember about components, web components, or really just elements in general, is that we have properties 
events and methods. That is the API surface of the, of the DOM elements that we have. And these are the API surface that the web components will have as well. And the last interesting thing is that the HTML is a serialized version of the DOM, right? It is how we serialize DOM, but it's, what we care about is the actual DOM and the DOM's APIs, not the HTML serialization. And so if you look at an example of input.value, the initial value is placed inside of the HTML, inside of the, the value property of the input. But if you want to read what the current state of the value is, you don't read the attribute, right? You read the property, because it's the property that has the good stuff. Now, HTML is a little tricky, and this is a little confusing, because HTML syncs the attributes and the properties, and they keep them constantly in sync. Not all of them. There's a whole bunch of attributes, uh, so a whole bunch of properties that only exist inside of uh, the DOM API. So for example, cursor position, selected, indexed, uh, scrolling position. All of these things are properties that you can only read on, in DOM. But many things are synced to the um, attributes, which makes this thing really confusing. And this is the reason why originally Angular 1 thought, like, well, there is no difference between attribute and properties. And we just randomly chose to have attributes. But it turns out that properties are really the way to go. Now, properties solve two interesting things. First of all, when you have properties, you get to pass models. Attributes only understand strings. But with properties, you can pass in complicated models down to your objects. And it solves the problem of Boolean attributes, as I pointed out earlier. So the big takeaway here is that we're changing two things. First of all, we're escaping the left-hand side of the expression. And the second part is that we are binding to properties, not to attributes of the, of the element. Now, you're saying, well, what about the double curly? I mean, so this is known as interpolation. It is so useful. It's everywhere. Can I please, please have it? And the answer is yes, you can have it. Uh, but the way you have to think about it is that it's just a shorthand for the bottom line. Uh, when you say title equals double curly expression, that's just a shorthand of saying bind the title property to the expression. But remember, interpolation always has to be a string. So we have to convert it into a string uh, and write it this way. Now, Angular 2 is going to do this for you. But notice, I'm not introducing a new concept. It's an existing concept. I'm just giving you a mental transformation that's happening between the double, the double curly and the actual binding system. Uh, on the end of the day, there is but one binding system in Angular 2. Now, there's an interesting set of things that happen. For example, in Angular 1x, we have this thing called ng-bind, which allows you to write to the text of an element. Notice how in Angular 2, we don't actually need this directive. It's just a binding to the text of the element. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I design something and I, in the process I, I come up with a new system which allows me to get rid of a whole bunch of previous concepts, I'm super excited. So when I saw this particular property emerge, I was like, yes, this is awesome. This is amazing. I don't need to have ng-bind element. It's not that we're not giving you the power. It's that it's fundamentally not needed because this, you can express the syntax directly. Now, there's a whole bunch of other things that this happens with. ng-bind HTML is just inner HTML. And my favorite is this one. Did you know that every DOM element has a property called hidden? And if you set it to true, the element hides? Well, why do we have ng hidden then? Or ng hide? It's just a hidden binding, right? And it turns out there's about 16 different um, directives that we have in Angular 1 to deal specifically with these cases. So all of these directives fundamentally just disappear in Angular 2. Um, now let's talk about the next one. So binding was a way of getting the data from the model to the UI for the rendering. There's also the second problem, which is how do we get data from the UI back to the model or back to the controllers? Now in Angular 1, there is this interesting example you can do. So I made up a component called component, and it has a select equals, and there's an expression in there. Turns out there's three different ways you can interpret this particular thing. And this is um, what makes, in my opinion, uh, the Angular one a little more complicated to tool is because the tools have a really hard time telling which of the three cases this is. So case number one, it could be that what the author of the component, not of the author of the, of the HTML, but the author of the component, what, he, what they meant is that the, there is a, some property called select, and that property is bound to the user.name current expression. So as the user.name current expression changes, uh, the select property inside of the component changes. 
So that's use case one. The use case two is they could have set up a bidirectional data binding, in which case the, what I just said holds, so the user.name gets executed all the time as part of the digest cycle. But in addition to it, sometimes the component gets to write to its property, in which case we will actually assign to this particular expression. So this actually could be a, have a side effect sometimes. And then there's a third mode where the way to think about select is not that it's a property, but rather it's an event that a component upon user action like selection, uh, the component says, I have been selected, and so it will execute this particular expression. And this is the, the crux of the problem, is like you as a person who's writing uh, this particular template, or the person who's reading an existing <laughs> template, you cannot tell which of the three of these modes th it's gonna happen in there. And it's not just you, it's also the tools cannot tell. And this makes tooling difficult, and it makes also difficult to read and understand and reason about what's going on. So we're going to split that up. And we're going to say, no, no, bindings, those is what we have seen earlier. We will use the bracket syntax to say this is an expression that is, we will, we will dirty watch this expression all the time. And when the expression changes, we'll ch update the select property. If you want the other kind, which is that when a component changes, when a component has become selected and it fires an event, we can... Uh, uh, we have this, the second syntax, and in this particular case, the, what you put under there is we're going to call it a statement. Now they look identical, but they actually have different behavior. So let's have a look. First of all, I'm showing you the two syntaxes, syn syntheses, uh, whatever. <laughs> you can see that there's all, I'm showing you also the uh, pure alphanumeric version of it up there as well. But here's the thing. When does the expression get executed? So the expressions get executed all the time as part of the change detection, whereas the statements only get executed as part of a user action, part of an event. Uh, side effects wise, the expressions should have no side effects because they're executed all the time and you don't know when, they really should not have side effects. On the other hand, a statement is all about a side effect. If you have a statement that has no side effect, that statement could essentially be removed and it doesn't do anything. Right? So the statement is all about having side effects. Now there's interesting things that we can do about these distinctions, which is, for example, null suppression. Null suppression is wonderful inside of double curlies, but it's actually a counterproductive inside of statements because you register a listener, you start clicking on it, nothing's happening, you don't know why, and it's because we're null suppressing. So we can actually tell them apart. And finally, when you have statements, you can use a semicolon, but you cannot use a semicolon with expression, so the expression has to be something that evaluates to a value. And by separating them, these things out, again, it's more easier to, it's easier to, to reason about these things. Now, this set of directives actually gets to get rid of more directives. So things like blur, change, checked, all of these event systems that we have and that we have added, uh, all of these things are actually unneeded because they're covered directly by the syntax. So another, I think there's about 20 directives that can be removed. Now let's talk about one last thing. Remember how I said that elements have properties, events, and methods? Well, we already covered the first two, right? The properties and events. So how do we cover the methods? So it turns out we already have an expression system that can call methods, and we do this all the time inside of our expressions and statements. The trouble is we can't get a hold of it. So let's look at this example in Angular 1. Suppose you have a button, and when you click on it, you want to put something else in focus. There's already a method called focus that does exactly what you want. The trouble is, there's no way for you to get a hold of it. And it's not just you can't get a hold of it inside of a template, there's really no way to get a hold of it inside of the controller either. Um, there's no good way of actually injecting this thing so that you can get a hold of it. And as a result, you probably have to do it by writing a custom directive, which then gets a hold of the input, and then if some expression changes, it will focus the input or something around, around those lines. So the way this is solved is that we introduce this concept of a reference. So in, inside of the input, we can now say, I am referring to this other input, and therefore, I can focus it. I can call methods on it. I can call it its API. And now we have covered everything. We have covered properties, we have covered events, and we have co covered methods. But an interesting thing happens when you explicitly declare variables. Can you spot all the errors in here? Turns out there are six of them. I'm going to highlight them for you. Uh, different things will be caught either because there's no suppression and so nothing will happen, or there's a typo and nothing will happen, um, and so on. And, but inside of Angular 2, 
because we get to declare ahead of time the references, uh, we can actually catch particular thing. We can look at the div and say, hey, you know, there is no property called title spelled with a Y on a div. You probably made a mistake, and we can give you this error immediately. We can look at the user mistyped again, and we can look at the uh, controller, and we can say, hey, there is no property called user on a controller, and we can give you an error immediately, and so on and so forth. So with these changes, we can actually give you useful error messages rather than having the application not work. And I'm sure that most of you guys are going to be excited about this particular part. Yeah. So let me reiterate this again. The, pro the, the DOM elements have three properties. There's uh, three things, three APIs, right? There's properties, events, and methods. And on the JavaScript side, I'm going to show you what would you do in something like jQuery. You would simply write to the property using the square bracket. Now you can see where the square is coming from inside of our syntax. You can set up add event listeners, which is a function call, hence the parentheses on the syntax over here. Or you could just refer to it as a variable. And this seems kind of like a no-op, but the key over here is by being able to refer to it, I can call methods. And so we have these three ways covered inside of the Angular 1 syntax. This is much easier to understand. There's fewer rules and fewer exceptions. And the nice thing is the web components really start to happen. So suppose you want to do a web component in Angular 1x. You might write something like this, but this actually isn't going to work. First of all, the ID equals V. Well, that's going to put it on a window, not actually on your scope. So you won't be able to get a hold of it. So you won't be able to say something like v.play. The next thing is, if you want to bind to an attribute called video ID, um, this may or may not work depending on whether the web component author has decided to set up a DOM listener events. Now, it is possible that they would set up a DOM listener events, and this is actually going to work. But I have this feeling that in the future, in the world where web components are going to be happening all the time, this is going to actually be considered an NCAP pattern because setting up DOM listeners is actually kind of expensive. And so, I believe most, most uh, authors will choose against this. Um, it's expensive in terms of setting them up, and it's also expensive in terms of firing them. So even if this would work, I'm not sure this is the best way to do it. And finally, let's say you want to class an object that is something other than a string. In here, in this example, the, uh, the head attribute is going to be written as a string, and so the, the information of the object actually gets destroyed. And so there's no way to actually pass uh, things other than strings into this particular thing. And finally, there is no such thing as ng state. We don't know what events the web component is going to uh, fire in the future. And as a result, we cannot give you all of the directives ahead of time. There could be endless number of these events, custom events the component might fire. And so while you would want to write this in Angular 1x, this is not going to work. But look at Angular 2. This is what essentially you would like to write inside of the code, right? You get a hold of it, you assign the properties to it, you set up a listener, you call a method on it. Right? It's that simple. We can express the same exact thing in the Angular 2 syntax. We can use the click with parentheses to say this is an event. If you click on it, please call V. Where is V coming from? Well, there's a hash V that says it's right over here. The video ID is, uh, is bound to a property, but so is a state. And as a result, state can have things other than uh, strings. You can have real objects. And finally, we can bind to any custom event um, that you can possibly imagine. We can call methods on it. Now. There's one thing we have not talked about, and that's microsyntax. And this thing, this was a tough nut to crack. Really, it, we spent many, many months thinking about this particular thing. Here's the problem. If you have something like ng-repeat, there's item in items. Well, it turns out um, item in items is neither a literal, nor an expression, nor a keyword. Like, what is this thing? You, you, I can't put it inside of a double curly. That's not going to work. That's going to blow up, right? So what is this? Well, it turns out what ngrep does is it runs it through a regex and it cuts things out. So in is a keyword, item is going to be a new variable that's going to be declared, and items is an expression. Can we express this in, in, a, in a simpler way that doesn't require this complicated parsing and understanding and you really having to read the ngrep documentation before you can even understand what part of this, this microsyntax we have? Well, it turns out we have. So first of all, Web Components defines a, something called a template. Now, I don't want to go too much into the details of template, but it turns out there's other reasons why this is a good idea to have a template tag in here. But let's just focus on a microsyntax. Um, we are thinking about rename ngrepeat to foreach, so let's just go with this for a second. 
Uh, so let's say it says for each. Notice it says hash item. I can refer to it. We know what that means. That's a variable, right? Because this was already covered in the previous syntax. And we know that in is going to be a property that's bound on an expression. So we know that items is an expression. Now, this is perfectly toolable. You, the tools can look at this, can read this, everybody can understand this, everybody knows what's happening. The only problem is it is quite wordy. Can we do something about the wordiness? Well, it turns out we can. What we can do is we can say, fundamentally, this is the only kind of templating system that Angular is going to understand. But we're going to give you a shorthand syntax that directly translates into this. Now, what is a shorthand syntax? A shorthand syntax is to simply say, any element can have a template, and you can place key value pairs of these bindings that were on the element down to here. And as you can see, they're separated by semicolons and they have equal signs. And so there's a direct translation from this syntax to the previous one, which is fully toolable, fully um, understandable. Nothing is, is, is complicated in there. But could we do even better? Well, one thing we can do is it turns out that uh, tools and humans can still understand this if we drop the semicolons and equal signs. And so now it just says for each item in items, and we still know what's going on. But we can do even better, which is we can take the for each and move it to the other side and just leave a star behind to let us know this is a template. This requires this, this set of transformations to happen before we can reason about it. And so this is the shorthand syntax. And notice, nothing here is special. It's, it's not like the ng repeat has to do complicated sort of parsings or anything like that. Or if you wanted to write your own custom directive that does these things, uh, you can just set up a key value pairs with variables that you're exporting, and uh, you know what's happening. So in this particular case, it becomes very clear that the item is actually referring to the item that the for each is exporting. And it actually helps with tooling. It actually helps with uh, speed. We can do all kinds of optimizations if you know these things. And it's part of the reason why Angular 2 is faster. So really, the goal here is to have a simpler syntax so it's easier to understand. It's predictable so it's faster. And it's toolable so you can have more amazing tool vendors building more amazing ways of, of having uh, easier to build applications. So at this point, I'm going to welcome Rado Kirov. He's one of our core team members. And we're going to show you actually a working um, application. So, right. thank you, Mishka. So we've been working uh, really hard on Angular 2 for the last few months, and I'm very excited to be here and to be able to actually show you a demo of Angular 2 running in a browser. So let's take a look at it. So what we have here is a simple application that takes a YouTube search term, searches for all the videos that contain that search term. You can see them all rendered in uh, nice material design cards. For each video, we see a thumbnail, some stats, a description of the video. If I click on the thumbnail, I get actual player. I can play the video. I can pause it. And finally, if I like it or I dislike it, I can click the little thumb icon. Obviously, I really like this one. So what we're going to do next is uh, we're going to go through how we built this, this uh, application in Angular 2 and uh, walk you through the steps of, of building so it. So every application starts with index.html. And uh, this is our index.html. Now, Angular 2 is still in the early versions. And so there are, we still don't have, we haven't simplified the, the script tags and CSS tags that you have to include. Rest assured, we're going to work on that. So if you look at, check out the demo, please just kind of glance over that particular part. But once you set up uh, all of the imports and all the scripts, the question becomes, how do I bootstrap this thing? Now, in here we have a tag called app. Now, in Angular 1x, we had ng-app. Here we just have an app, and it has some content inside of it. App is in no way special, not like ng-app in Angular. We could have called it a div. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what it's over here. We just chose app, and it's a component. Now, Angular 2, um, we kind of simplified the concept of an application. We have a concept of an application, but there's no concrete thing we call an application like in Angular 1x. Instead, what we have is a top-level component, and Rado is going to show you what a top-level component looks like. So let's take a look at the application component. So here it is. Application is just an a ES6 class. And, and sorry, let me just point out, uh, we're showing you uh, the demo in TypeScript because we're excited about this stuff. You can write this stuff in ES5 if you choose. We're not forcing you in any way to use any kind of translation or compilation or extra step. This could be done in purely good old JavaScript ES5. Uh, you get other benefits. All right, so back to the application component. 
It is a ES6 class, and it has two annotations. We heard yesterday that annotations are coming to TypeScript. So the way you think about those two annotations, they're just syntactic sugar to attach some metadata to this application class. So the first one is the component annotation. That's what tells Angular this application class is actually an Angular component. It contains a selector. The selector is just a CSS selector. It tells you where in the HTML the component will get triggered. Then we have a configuration for dependency injection through component services. So we all love dependency injection in Angular, in Angular 1. It's here to stay in Angular 2. It is, dependency injection is what will construct the actual application instance. So this is just a configuration for it. Next we have the template annotation where we specify the visual representation of the component. We have some HTML that would be put in place for the component. And then we have the directives that are active within that template. If you're wondering why our components and template annotations split, that is because we might want to have many to one mapping between components and templates. One component might be backed by two or three different templates, depending on whether you want to serve your application for mobile or desktop, or you want to do an A-B test. So let's bootstrap the application. So I'm gonna come here in the main method and type bootstrap that we know from Angular 1, and the difference for Angular 2 is we're just gonna pass this top-level component. So notice how in Angular 1 you have to pass in all kinds of module definition information to kind of get your application going and set up the injector. Turns out all of that information is encapsulated into the component, uh, and there's nothing extra special that can happen, and we just chosen this particular component to be our top-level component. Now the other thing to point out is that it said loading, please wait. Notice that it's still there. We just uh, um, we added a shadow root to the application, and the content tag is a replacement of transclusion. Um, and so we're, re we're retiring the concept of transclusion in favor of uh, web components and the shadow DOM standard. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I really want to know what, what next year's shy talk is going to be about now that he cannot make fun of template, uh, transclusion. All right, so let's continue building this application. I'm sure he's going to find something, though. <laughs> so we go back to the application component, and um, the template we have so far is not very featureful. Let's replace it with a, an actual good-looking template. Uh, <laughs> so what I'm doing right now is I'm switching to this uh, application HTML template that I have already written. And uh, before I switch to the template, I want to just point out what do we have in the application component. We have a fetch method. This is what triggers the API call to actually get the set of videos I'm looking for. And I'm storing them in the videos member variable for the application component. So now let's switch to the template. So in the template, we see exactly where we use the fetch method. We event bind it to the button using the parent syntax that Mishko described the reasoning behind. And once I get my set of videos, I'm using, again, the for each syntax that we saw a little bit earlier to iterate over them, and for each one of them, I'm displaying so far just the title. One, one thing to point out as you look at, at this template, if you look at all the expressions you see, and you think, where are those symbols coming from? Where is fetch, videos? They're all coming from the, straight from the instance of the application component. There was no other concept or some hash map where they come from. They're directly coming from there. And there's one extra thing, which is as we're iterating, we need to have a reference for the, vi the current video we're seeing. And I can immediately spot it in the component, in the template, by looking for this pound. So you might be wondering what happened to the scope. Um, so the scope is kind of there, kind of not there, because the execution context for all the expressions is just the controller's instance. Uh, now, we, in Angular 1x, we're basically recommending that you use controller as syntax because of the to make sure that every single expression has a dot inside of it so that the property, the, the prototypical read versus the local write problem that sometimes occurs with ng model, so that that particular problem can be solved. Uh, turns out we solved this problem in a different way in Angular 2, so we no longer use prototypes for reading and writing, and it actually has uh, performance implications, which are in, in a positive way. Um, but the scope as a concept has really kind of disappeared. Instead, what we have 
is we just purely bind directly to the controller instance. That means you no longer have to inject scope or you no longer have to expose yourself and have this extra variable uh, that is really, probably everybody always just called it a CTRL. Uh, so that's simplified as well. Okay, so, so far we've seen how to create one component. The next thing you probably want to do is in create a child component that lives within our parent component. So let's do that. So in our, my application component, I want to include another component which makes the, the, the video card look better. That is what I call the search result component. First thing I do is I activate it in my template by adding it to the directives list. Next thing is I come to the template and I start using it. It is the actual HTML tag that triggers it. It's called search result. That just instantiates the component. I also want to pass some data to it because having a component without data is not very useful. So I pass the video data into it. Again, to reiterate what Mishko said earlier, if you take a look at video right here, and if you're wondering is this a literal or an expression, it is immediately clear that this is an expression because of the square brackets we see right before in front of it. So we know this video is an expression, and this expression comes from the variable defined right above it. Now you might be wondering why Rado had to explicitly import the particular component before using it. So in Angular 1x, there was a global registry of all of the components, all of the directives that you can use. In Angular 2, we're making that registry per component. And that, what that allows us to do is to do proper encapsulation. You no longer have to worry that if somebody imports a directive that has a selector, for example, required, and you also happen to import a directive that has a selector called required, that the two selectors will collide. Uh, the way we tried to solve it in Angular 1x is we made everything prefixed, um, which is kind of a workaround rather than a solution. This is an actual solution which uh, imports every single thing explicitly. And as a result, as you, what you're seeing now is that there's a lot fewer prefixes of attributes inside of the HTML. Uh, we think that's actually a good thing, but nothing obviously stops you from having the, the prefixes. The other thing is you'll be able to group these things. So you won't be able, you wouldn't have to enumerate every single directive that you want. You can say, like, you, typically I use these set of directives within my components, and now you can just import a single item instead of enumerating every single one of them. All right, so next thing you might want to do is, we've seen how you pass data down to your child components. You might want to have a, a way to communicate from the child components up to the parent components. So data binding only works down to children. To communicate back up, to do the reverse mechanism, we use events. So one place I need this in my application is, when you remember when I clicked on the thumbs, I need to go back up to the parent component and update the actual counts. So let's see how to achieve this. If I open the thumbs component, we see it is a, an event emitter for a change event. So now I can come back in the parent component, find where I am using the thumbs component, and add a change, a change listener uh, that is bound to the change event coming from the thumbs component. And on that change, I am executing this statement, which is saying, go to the method called temps change and re reflect the changes back. So what's happening is that all of the data that is being projected to the UI is really has one set of bindings, which is the square brackets. And the, all the data that comes back to the model has a different kind of binding, which is the, the parentheses. Sometimes I refer to them as the forward and reverse data binding. And by, by having this clear separation, uh, it turns out that the data going forward, which is the, the ones inside of square brackets, becomes unidirectional and becomes what we call a uh, directive acyclic graph, which means that there are no cycles. There, it is not possible for you to get in a situation where one binding will affect another one. And because you can't get into the situation, we don't have to run the digest cycle more than once. So the digest cycle is not, no longer a cycle, it's just a digest phase. Uh, becomes exactly once through the digest cycle, which has an important, again, more important uh, implications for performance. The other thing that this does, it makes the performance more predictable because you know it's ex happening exactly once. Um, and you don't have to worry about setting this thing called a TTL. I'm not sure if many people are familiar with it, but there's this time to live for the scope digest cycle inside of one Gila 1x, which also goes away. So this separation makes it easier to read, so you can follow where the data is going to the UI or is having side effects, and it also uh, has performance implications, which makes it go faster. 
Oh, there he is. Glad you like it. <laughs> Faster is always better. So what we have so far is we have our data. We are showing it. Uh, we don't have actual video player. If I click on the thumbnail, it just disappears. So I want to add a, a, a video player. Um, it's a common problem. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to. I, I want to reuse a component. Well, this is Angular 2. We don't have that many components written yet. We're still in alpha. What I happen to notice, though, there is a very convenient web component uh, that is built with a Polymer library. It's called Google YouTube. I have its API right here. I take a look. It has some properties I can bind to. It has some events I can listen to and some methods that I can call. Should sound familiar. We heard those three fundamental types of APIs that Angular components have and web components have. So I'm going to go right ahead and use it. So right here, I am just going to say Google YouTube. I add it as a HTML tag, and that's pretty much all I have to do. Now, what's interesting to know is that Angular uh, didn't treat Polymer in any special way. I, we know it's not because we're friends with, I mean, we are friends with Polymer folks, but it's not because of that is the reason why it works with uh, Polymer. It is works with Polymer because we followed the fundamental web components practices uh, in there. And so not just Polymer becomes available, but also Bricks, XTags, or any other future library that chooses to use web components. So this is kind of the promise of it all, and this is very exciting. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that Angular doesn't even know that there is a web component underneath it. All the Angular knows is it has to instantiate a particular element at a particular location. That's all we know. The, the other thing we know is we have to write to certain properties and set up certain listeners. And we, cannot, we don't even actually uh, differentiate whether that particular element is a native uh, browser element or it is a web component. This is kind of the beauty of it all, uh, is that it's completely uniform. Let's take a look again at how I actually integrated the YouTube uh, component. The YouTube component needed a video ID. I passed it using the data binding with square brackets. And it was, it was uh, emitting the state change event. And I listened to it using the parents. If you're having a deja vu, this is exactly the same APIs and methods that we use for Angular components a few seconds earlier. I think this is very exciting. One API for all components. <laughs> Finally, the last new thing I used is I have this reference, this variable binding here to the player, to the player variable, just so I can use it in my button right below. So right below, on click, I'm binding the player pause and play method out of the, of the Google YouTube component. So now you might be wondering why we put uh, the play directly inside of the HTML and why doesn't it go through a component? Now, we're certainly going to enable you so that you can go through a component. But in this particular case, I think this is a feature. Because imagine you have different templates, one for a desktop, one for a mobile device. It's very likely that the mechanism by which you play a video on a desktop is going to be different than the mechanism by which you play a video on a mobile. You might not even have a buttons for mobile and, and so on. And so as a result, not only are you going to have different HTML for the mobile device, uh, you're actually going to have different components or different web components in there. And those web components will have different methods for starting and pausing the video. So by putting all of, by being able to, able to express all of this information in the template, we're actually allowing you to make sure you have a single controller, but have multiple ways of, re of representing that information to the user. All right. Lastly, we heard yesterday by uh, the talk from the Open Table folks how uh, Shadow DOM really can enhance the reusability of your components. Since Angular 2 is using Shadow DOM right out of the box, we are reaping those benefits right here in this little app. So if you remember, I had this panel, this uh, description and stats panels that I could switch between with, uh, with a click of a button. Let's see how I implemented that. I see there's a component called either panel, and within it, there are two divs, one with class left and one with class right. Now, if I open the either panel component itself, I see two content tags. They're directly projecting the left piece and the right piece, and they're doing all the decoration and all the transitioning between the two panels. The great benefit that you see here is either panel is completely detached 
from the logic of the application itself. It has nothing to do with videos or YouTube. And, uh, and it could have been written by a UI library or some, some other team within your organization. So the nice thing is we can retire our transclusion friends, uh, replace it with, uh, with uh, web components of Shadow DOM, and turns out Shadow DOM actually has a lot more features than Transclude ever did. Like this example of having multiple contents, being able to select portion of it. Actually, you can even bind to the uh, select attribute of the content and change what exactly you're binding and projecting uh, in the future. The other thing is we actually get to um, uh, benefit by having somebody else write all the documentation about Shadow DOM and content and how it works. <laughs> So we don't have to explain it. We don't have to make up terms. Uh, I'm super excited about this whole Shadow DOM thing. It is really, really nice. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, well, but Shadow DOM is not available on my browser, so what do we do about that? So it turns out what we're going to do is we're going to emulate the Shadow DOM on all the browsers in Angular. So as a developer, you're going to pretend that there is a Shadow DOM. You're going to, when you talk to your coworkers, you're going to use words like uh, Light DOM and Projection and Shadow DOM. Um, everything that you will be doing will be as if Shadow DOM existed, but all of this will be emulated uh, by Angular uh, for you on all the browsers. So that, that's the end of our demo. Um, I, ho I, I hope you're just as excited as I am about achieving that same productivity you know and love from 1x while really reducing the mental overhead, the overload that you had to do to learn the framework and to really understand how the framework works. So this is the end of our demo, as Eddie said. We are really excited about this. I am so excited. I'll tell anybody who will want to talk to me about all the amazing things that's happening in Angular 2. Uh, and I'm super excited to see what kind of amazing things you guys are going to build using Angular 2 in the future. Thank you.